Hello, my name is Rocio Rivera and I'm in the Faculty of Animal Sciences. My lab studies epigenetic assisted reproduction and assisted reproduction and epigenetics. And uh, for 13 years, we have been uh, trying to understand this um, overgrowth condition that happens in cattle and humans known as uh, large husband syndrome, which is induced by assisted reproduction and is the result of epigenetics. So let, let, let me first give you a description of what epigenetics is um, before I talk about the, the syndrome. And you are familiar with this type of picture. These are the chromosomes which contains all the genetic information, the A, T, Cs, and Gs, that make an organism what it is. We have two copies, one from mom, one from dad, that has the exact same copy, uh, the exact same sequence, letters, except perhaps for a few uh, differences here and there. And this very long molecule of DNA fits within this nucleus, in, um, which is like a pinhole in size. And the, the, the way it fits is because it's able to wrap around uh, itself and some proteins, and, and all of this is functional. So if you're thinking of genetics, you are thinking of uh, the hardware, the DNAs, the sequence. And uh, that sequence is very, very stable. It usually requires uh, evolutionary time, extreme environment or, or disease to cause a difference in a base so here, uh, example A to T. And sometimes that difference results in something that we find cute, like, like these ears uh, in cats. But other times it's not, uh, it's not good and it results in, in malformations and death. As the, as the example of CVM. If I were in front of you uh, uh, in, a, in a conference hall, for example, I would ask you by a, a raise of hands if you thought that any of these three examples were genetic mutations. For example, these, these uh, the petunias or these mice, which are all from the, the same litter, right? So here is a lean and an obese mouse, yellow and brown. Uh, also, the, the workers and the queen, they're quite different. And uh, however, they, there's no DNA uh, uh, difference between them. They all have the same DNA. Similarly, um, when you're thinking of, of our body, for example, we have all these different types of tissues. We have muscle, we have intestine, liver. However, all of these have the exact same DNA also. You wouldn't think that they're the same, but the, the, the DNA, the instructions, the set of instructions is identical in all of this tissue. So both of these types of examples are, uh, these are the results of epigenetic phenomena. So um, epigenetics literally means above DNA. And while genetics or DNA is the hardware information, uh, epigenetics is the software, how that information is taken and used. And, and this is the machinery that, uh, that you can think of this machinery as, as a set of on-off switches. For example, if you think of the epigenome as an accordion player and DNA as the accordion, then if the DNA is closed, any information that's over here cannot be read, right? So, so there would be an analogy here with the book. This book has thousands of words inside, but you cannot read them because the book is closed. It's the same thing that happens with DNA. So a gene that's required for brain function would be turned off in the liver. Now, if we think of the epigenome again, the set of the machinery that, that makes the DNA behave the way it does, if the epigenome opens the DNA, now any information that is within it can be read. So in this case, this is the brain, and now these are uh, genes that, we, uh, that are involved in, in brain functions, now they're able to be read. So it's, it's like opening the book. So when, when uh, we first are formed as a one cell embryo, uh, we get two sets of uh, DNA, 
one that comes from father, one that what comes from mother, from the egg and the sperm. And each set of, uh, of uh, genetic material will have one copy of a chromosome. Then uh, the first division to the two cell stage, each cell is going to have the complete complement of chromosomes and DNA. And then uh, divisions will continue. So if you can imagine this ball being the one cell embryo, then if this ball follows this path, then it will form the liver. Then the heart, a different path, um, will give rise to the lungs. And finally, another path will give rise to a stomach. Uh, and, and finally, the, 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 an individual, right? So all of these are epigenetic phenomena. It's reading information from the same DNA molecule, but it's only reading and using that which it needs. So, so far, uh, we can summarize this section as, as uh, that, that we all have one DNA, one genome, okay? But we have many epigenomes. Uh, we have 200 different cell types, 80 organs, 12 organ systems, and each one of these will have its, its specific sets of instruction, even though they are all reading them from the same DNA molecule. And what I mentioned before that DNA is very, very stable. It requires evolutionary time to, to have a base change. The epigenome is labile and is continuously gauging environment and that's both normal physiologic environment but also external stimuli like like contamination stress um, uh, bacterial um, uh, famine the different stimuli can affect the the epigenome differently and the the outside stimulus that we study is assisted reproduction and assisted reproduction is a series of procedures used uh, to produce offspring uh, in several species, cattle and human included. And in this case, this is a, a ovary from cow. We can collect them in the lab or go to the farm and collect them from the ovary, from the cow, the, they collect the ovum, then do in vitro fertilization. And then we will do in, uh, in vitro culture and allow those embryos to divide. And then if desired, we will take this type of embryo, which is called a blastocyst, and transfer it to a cow. Now, uh, collectively, the, these techniques are called assisted reproductive technologies. In cattle, usually referred to as in vitro production of embryos. Uh, these technologies are extensively used uh, both in human and cow. Over uh, 8 million uh, kids have been born from the use of assisted reproduction. And in cattle, this is a figure uh, from 2018 showing that 1.1 uh, embryos were transferred worldwide. And usually those procedures, the offspring that result from those procedures are fine, but every so often there are, there are some abnormalities that occur. And here is an example. This is an overgrowth, uh, overgrown calf. At birth, it weighed 98 kilograms, where normal weight is 45 kilograms and the calf could never stand up and died at six days of uh, age. Large offspring syndrome, uh, this is a congenital overgrowth syndrome uh, in which tongues can be large, the organs are uh, large or can be outside of the body at birth, uh, also overgrowth. These uh, calves often die because of dystocia and uh, sometimes they, even the cow will die. In humans, there is a similar syndrome that happens naturally, about one in 10,300 uh, cases uh, or uh, birth. Uh, and it's phenocopies disease. You see the large tongue, umbilical hernias, or, or organs outside of the body. Now, one thing that is, uh, that is quite severe in these kids is that they will have an increased incidence of cancer. And uh, both syndromes occur naturally, and both syndromes are promoted by assisted reproduction, which speaks to the epigenetic nature of, of this syndrome. So, except for a few instances in the human syndrome, uh, most of this has nothing to do with the DNA sequence. It's just that the sets of instructions that, that drive growth, normal growth, 
were incorrectly silenced or activated. And then uh, this is the result um, of, of uh, in this case, overgrowth. This is a, for those that experience it, it's an expensive problem. Uh, this is a, 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 I asked two people I know that experienced this, the, the owner of this calf uh, was born then, and an embryo transfer technician to, to please calculate for me the expected loss as a result of LOS, and they each independently calculated about $29,000. And uh, I also have inquired from embryo transfer or genetic improvement companies to tell me if, if uh, you know, if they see this syndrome and, and the incidence. It, this is very hard uh, data to find because most of this is not published, but it is affecting the, the industry. Now, back with Wedemann syndrome, uh, if this, when these kids are born, they uh, and identified as, as BWS, they will undergo blood draws every six weeks until they're four years and ultrasounds every three months until they're eight. To, and that's done to detect uh, tumors. And uh, this kid, this is one example, and the parents of this kid are facing $2 million in debt already for all the surgeries and the cancer treatment and they still have to do the tongue reduction. So, so this is, this is a, a financial burden uh, for families and you can imagine the poor kid uh, undergoing blood draws. Uh, that would be horrible. So uh, for all this year, we have been learning about the syndrome. We have been trying to understand how those sets of instruction are, um, uh, you know, how the epigenome is controlled and we have some understanding of that now. So we, we hope to be able to help farmers ET and genetic improvement companies, and also the cow and the calf, which usually both die because of this. And for that, we have done uh, several studies, and in one, we collected, uh, or uh, we took ultrasound, ultrasound measurements of all the fetuses during pregnancy. This is day 55. We also collected blood from the pregnant mothers in order to see uh, if we can identify any marker of overgrowth in the maternal blood. And also, we're trying to understand how early that trigger, that signal that, that changed the epigenome, that changed the set of instructions, how early that happens uh, during embryogenesis. Uh, we have also collected these fetuses at different times of gestation. Uh, day 56, day 105, and we have an expert pathologist, uh, Dr. Fred William from the vet school here, who uh, was in charge of collecting all of these fetuses to identify pathologies. And uh, so this is from the previous study. You can see that we have uh, large tongues, overgrowth, umbilical hernias, we have ear uh, malformations, eye protrusions, all characteristics of BWS as well. And uh, in my, the most current study, we again produce this to follow up on some work. And you can see the extreme sizes of uh, this LOS when compared to control in both uh, females and males. We have large tongues, we have organ malformations, and here you can even see the asymmetry of the head. And body asymmetry is a characteristic of uh, BWS. So our work, uh, hopes to identify LOS in bovine embryos produced by assisted reproduction before embryo transfer. We hope to determine the molecular mechanisms, how all those switches, on-off switches, are uh, altered that results in these syndromes. And then uh, also because we are aware that this happens spontaneously, that, that uh, maybe this syndrome um, which has not been named before until very recent by us, uh, may, may explain some of the perinatal death that results from unknown causes or distortion. Uh, one favor I, I will ask you guys is that if anybody becomes aware of this syndrome, either art produced or spontaneously, to please contact me. I would love to chat uh, with you about that. And also we hope to, uh, that our work will help uh, uh, humans. Uh, here is Jennifer Kalish, and she is the curator of the Bed with Women uh, registry in the US, and she specializes in Bed with Women syndrome. And one thing that is difficult for these children 
is that uh, there is no a real good set of diagnostics. And uh, the idea is that whatever we learn with the cow will help agriculture, but will also help uh, with the diagnostics of these children. And with that, I will conclude my talk. And uh, please, if you have any questions, any concerns, anything you wanna chat about, don't, don't hesitate to email me or call me or we can Zoom, whatever you prefer. I love to talk about this. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you.